Hey, my name's Adam from Toronto, Ontario, and I subscribe to the Creative Control Patreon because I feel that uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are very few people in the industry who are able to consistently get the kind of quality interviews out of very diverse subjects of many creative stripes and disciplines, as Vish does pretty well on every episode of the podcast. It's a no-brainer to me that I want to support this when you factor that in to uh, all of the bonus content you get on Patreon, and, you know, it's a listener-supported podcast, so uh, I want to keep the uh, great content coming. So that's why you should also support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Matana Roberts is an acclaimed musician, composer, and multimedia artist who originally hails from Chicago, Illinois. A founding member of the trio Sticks and Stones, Roberts has contributed to albums by Godspeed You Black Emperor, TV on the Radio, Burn Sugar, and Deerhoof, among many, many others. Roberts has also worked in all manner of realms, including dance, theater, and poetry. She continues to develop Coin Coin, her acclaimed multi-chapter album series of panoramic sound quilting, which, according to her record label Constellation, aims to, quote, expose the mystical roots and channel the intuitive spirit-raising traditions of American creative expression while maintaining a deep and substantive engagement with narrativity, history, community, and political expression within improvisatory musical structures, end quote. The fourth chapter is called Coin Coin Memphis, an extraordinarily stirring record, which Constellation released on October 18th, 2019, and it prompted Roberts and I to have an in-depth conversation about its sound and lyrical themes, her personal and professional trajectory and relationships with her parents, the significance of the Coin Coin series as a whole, her future plans, and more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 524th episode of Creative Control featuring the thoughtful and multi-talented Matana Roberts with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Matana. How are you? Good. Nice nice to speak with you. Uh, where in the world are you, first of all? I'm in Berlin today. Oh, Berlin. What what brings you to Berlin? I'm doing a arts residency uh, in Berlin for part of this year. So I'm in Berlin for part of the year right now. Oh, cool. How have you... You've probably been there before i assume i I, i'm just assuming i'm being presumptuous but i've not i've not gotten a chance to spend bulk periods of time in berlin so this is a really special thing that i get to spend some actual time it's a great city yes i've never been actually i've heard it's it's a nice one i would love it i would love it okay what what's the nature of of your uh sort of assignment there exactly what are you gonna what are you doing i'm just working on my studio practice really trying to get deeper into my graphic score art practice trying to find a better balance with being the creator of those pieces but also trying to find a better balance with performance trying to take some time to really dig in to what my purpose is at this point with some of the work I'm trying to make I'm also doing some research on the one of the next chapters of coin coin is going to involve the second world war 
And so there's some research I'm doing here on that as well. Okay. Wow, that sounds very interesting. So it's it's almost an existential residency. You're trying to figure yourself out. Well, yeah, I guess I don't ever do um, residencies where I have to have some sort of finished project at the end. I've Earlier in my days of trying to pull it together. I tried those. Those don't really work for me. And so this is more, I, this is more of kind of a fellowship um, that allows mid-career artists to, you know, wade the waters a little bit and either stretch out their practice or collapse. I think I'm at a point where I'm trying to figure out what things I can just leave alone for now and what things do I really want to focus on I see okay within that you seem to be an artist who in in sort of expressing themselves and as I say I, I so I say it sort of cavalierly you know trying to figure yourself out I feel like you're also deeply immersed in our shared histories um, and the history of the world you know socio-political uh, aspects of of history uh, I assume learning and, and studying those things and then trying to, uh, you know, articulate them via your music is a, a way of also learning a little bit about yourself. Is that fair to say? Uh, like, you know, studying all this history, I, I assume it, it, it informs your current worldview. Oh, sure. Yeah, it allows me to, um, I mean, it is a, sort of a prop that I use for myself sometimes in terms of trying to make my way through the world and trying to deal with all the conundrums that uh, you're just faced with as a human and looking at history, seeing continual stories of perseverance, seeing continual stories of people being knocked down and they get right back up, like the, the, the source of the human condition really moves me mm. and it, it keeps me moving, I think. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's an excellent way of putting it. I mean, there's hope within the darker things that you're exploring, like the darker aspects of our timeline, shared timeline, you're, you're looking for the hope a little bit. Oh, yeah, because for me, the whole, at least with this particular project, the whole, it's all hope because, and it's all joy, even in the darkness, because I exist. Yeah. Like these things I'm looking at made it possible for me to be running around the world with a saxophone in my hand. And so I, I feel really happy about that even in uh, peeling back some of these layers of sadness yeah no that's fair now, i want to ask you about this series that you alluded to coin coin we're at as we're speaking we're at chapter four memphis congratulations on this uh, very wonderful record by the way thank you so much i'm so glad it's out there yes no it, it's a it's a gorgeous album let's just for people who aren't familiar with this series as i say we're at chapter four can you encapsulate what coin coin has been about for you and why you see these uh, records as being interconnected? Coin Coin is, is kind of twofold in that it's about, again, my interest in the human condition and how no matter where we come from, we all experience these different emotional states of happiness, sadness, gladness, anger, you know, all these things uh, that are particular. My fascination with narrative, uh, pulling from... I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's an ancestral project. It's really not that, but I understand why it would seem that to be obvious. My grandmother is on the cover of the new record. Yeah. For me, the the ancestral moments are just these small hallmark, hallmarks that I use as jump off points into the actual history of the time period that I'm working with. And it, it's helped to give me kind of an entry way into some really difficult narrative in a way I'm not sure I'd be able to access otherwise. Um, but it's it's placed in a series in the way it is, not only for my love of American history, but for my love of abstract and experimental composition. And so I've divided it into chapters as a, as a nod to the narrative, as a nod to my love of just reading, but as a route to the different types of sonic fabrics I'm trying to explore in each segment of the work. I see. Now, you, you mentioned that your grandmother is on the cover of the new album, and for those who haven't seen it, it appears to be a mugshot, right? Yes. Right. And I'll ask you more about that in a moment, but I just want to jump back to what you were saying about other people ascribing this series as being an ancestral project, and, and you kind of maybe resisting that that sort of designation. Why do you suppose people think it's an ancestral project? Is it just because you 
seem to be tracing your own family history or because I, as I say, I see a, a more holistic view of our our progression as a people um, on some level within the work here. But can you speak to that? Why do you suppose people are trying to ascribe something deeply personal to you and your expression? Well, I, because the work, when each chapter has been completed, the document becomes this kind of really blanket of experience that I, I think touches people in ways that even I couldn't have imagined when I started the project. And and the stories that of which people share with me whenever I perform the work or share the work has alerted me to the fact that, ah, this is, you know, poking on these issues pushes buttons in people to dig into their own personal experience. And so I understand that and I uh, appreciate that. And there is a, you know, there is a whole, how do you say, genre of ancestral work across mediums. And so I'm not trying to shy away from that, but I don't want people to feel isolated. And if I'm, if I say the work is this thing that's just so personal to me, then I feel like it doesn't give them a way to enter. And so I just like to keep it a, a bit broader. I, I feel like it has an inherently inclusive aspect to it, if I might say. No, I'm glad. That is very happy for me to hear. My fear is that in talking about the work or people, you know, they say, oh, it's an ancestor work or, oh, no, she's just dealing with the African-American experience. It's like, well, no, I'm dealing with the American experience, but I'm also dealing with these universals that go beyond these ideas of, of how we are different from each other. I really want people to feel that in the work and 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 so far it seems like some have gotten it just as you just said well uh, it's curious i feel like just because of the nature of the atrocities that have been committed against certain people uh, you know i think we're kind of uh, more accustomed to hearing uh, oral histories and shared histories of african-american people perhaps or indigenous people perhaps uh, but I think sometimes we we preclude ourselves from having a history if we, we if we're not part of a group like that. If that makes any sense, like we all have our own histories in this timeline, right? I mean, we all are woven into the fabric of the world and our cultural backgrounds and whatnot too. I think um, maybe I, you're sort of hinting at the fact that maybe if someone isn't, I don't think you're saying this, but your the perception might be if someone isn't African American and can't relate to some of the historical stuff you're discussing, they may not be able to engage with the work. But I don't, we're all the same on some level, and we all have our histories. I mean, some of us face much worse hardships than others, but I feel like we are connected by our shared history, right? No, I agree with you. It's just, it's been my experience that some people speak about the work in that way as a way to belittle it a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and that's something that I feel that as an African American identified Per looking person, you know, I have so many different bloodlines running through me, but I know what people see when they see me, and I know how that sometimes translates over the work with some really odd designations and odd questions. I'm I'm ecstatic to be a part of this chain link fence of a black excellence. Like I'm aiming, I'm definitely mm -hmm. trying to be a part of that, and I the history of that alone gets me up every day. But I defy being placed in a corner about, oh, well, the work is just this. No, it's multi-layered, really. Yeah. And, and yeah, and that's what I'm going for. Now, I, I alluded to the fact, or you alluded to the fact, that the cover image is your, uh, did you say it was your grandmother? Is that right? Yeah, yeah that is my grandmother. What is the context of this mugshot? I must ask. I meant to ask. I'm, I'm following up on that. What is the context of this mugshot? Well, I, you know... I've heard completely different stories through, you know, over the course of my childhood as to why she was arrested. And the last story that I had gotten is that she had been arrested for speeding in Chicago. She liked her cars fast. Mm. And that I knew even, even as a child much later on. But this photo was taken in the 40s. And I'm not, I don't know a lot about what her life was like then. I only have little tidbits. But she had a, photo albums in her living room on the south side of Chicago that were stuffed in a corner. And when I would visit in the summers, I would spend a lot of time 
thumbing through those uh, photo albums and the mugshot photo had its own page. She wanted yeah. us to see it. She wanted us to know that it existed. And, and I just, it, it pretty much summed up to me what her spirit was about and what it was like. And I really wanted to use it mm. as a cover. And she also, she was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. She had a very strong uh, grassroots community ethos that I believe got its start there with her family there, a lot of things that they did in the city of Memphis that still kind of exist today. And I felt like people needed to be reminded of the importance of defiance and how you, you can live beyond. You know, whatever happened, how whatever happened in that arrest, she continued to go on and she did wonderful things for many people. And so I just wanted to remind people of, of about the possibility of defiance, nice. what, what is possible. Now, I, how fast could a car in 1940 Chicago actually go? How, how, how do you speed? I, I can't see someone speeding in the 40s. No, you know, and that's why I couldn't. I've never completely bought that story. And I've tried to locate more information on that mugshot, and those records no longer exist. Mm. So I, and she passed away in 2005. And no one seems to have like a right the right story. So I, I just am glad that the that the photo exists and I feel like we're living in a time where we need to be reminded of the importance of defiance. As an artist when you're when you're, you know, going through this process of trying to create a, a historical work, is it is it exciting when you f discover these gaps? Because these gaps might enable you to fill in the blanks, so to speak. I mean, you want it to be accurate on some level, but I also feel like these are adaptations where you kind of like, I this is this is great. This is where I get to fill this in. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the whole chapter, all the chapters, but this chapter in particular, like I, it's a mix of narrative that bounces on things that are true and bounces on things that are not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things within the story that I tell in chapter four that I, I don't know if happened. That, that is my imagination. I, the, the roots of that story definitely happened. Mm. But in terms of uh, the little girl who I speak of running after a rabbit in the woods or her father telling her to run, I made those things up. Right. And that's my way of filling in. I, I'm not so sure if I can even say that these records are historical documents in more that there are they are impressions yeah. of historical moments. But the most hard hitting moments in these records and on this record are true as far as the story was shared with me. I am repeating verbatim what was shared with me. Mm. I'm filling filling in gaps all over the place. And that's my creative license there while trying to stay respectful to the people whose narrative I'm trying to share. Well, I'm glad you brought up that little pair. I guess it's a, it's a recurring motif of, of a daughter recollecting uh, words from her father, run baby run um, after run, this rabbit, run. right? That, yeah. I've got that right. And I, I understand that this is a narrative device, but I do want to draw people's attention to an aspect of your liner notes for Coin Coin Chapter 4, Memphis. This recording, sure. this recording is dedicated to the memory of my father, a difficult human I'm still begrudgingly proud of. He believed deeply in the power of sound, the power of mindset, the power of questioning. He also introduced me to this music. Dr. D.L. Roberts, a.k.a. Black Gold, West Side, 1952 to 2017. You are, it, it's when I heard these run, this Run Baby Run, this dialogue between a daughter and her father, I couldn't help but think it was a deeply personal thing. I mean, I'm obviously connecting this liner note <laughs> uh, to that a little bit. Am I off base here? This seems to be no. a, a meditation about you and your father a little bit. No, you're totally not off base. Because when I had to think about, you know, in the beginning of kind of my musical journey, I've worked with children a lot. I don't have any children of my own, but I've, I've spent I spent a good time working with small children and learning about like how wide and vast their memory narrative techniques can be, especially when dealing with trauma, because I often worked in neighborhoods, of low income neighborhoods with amongst children who were not being cared for in the way that you would want a child to be cared for. So, so there's part of that in terms of trying to enter into that mindscape, but also, you know, my father was 
Yes, he was incredibly. He was a very difficult person, and I and I get it. I'm I'm able to look at it in a different kind of way. But the relationship that I had with him when I was maybe around the age that the little girl that I'm speaking through is is an age that I remember was really loving and really I felt really. Um, valued and cared for in a way that I did not feel much later. Yeah, and and that's a whole other story. So I did channel when I thought about that. I was like, what would it feel like for a child who has felt love, care, and safety in her home to have to be forced into the kind of this new reckoning of being? And I channeled, I plugged right into that relationship that I had with my father at that time. And in fact. The way that I, the way that phrase came up, I mean, it, that phrase when I wrote that, it just poured out. Mm. But when I speak it, every time I say it, it sounds just like my father to me. I can hear my father actually saying those words, mm. and so for me, in a sense, and and all the chapters have some little something, some little autobiographical something in there, but performing this work as I did just recently and saying those words, it's giving me some sense of healing within the grief of, of this arc that can happen. Families are so weird, you know, things yeah. and, and petty. <laughs> oh my God. So petty. I know. petty. Let me tell you. And so my mother died um, before, right before chapter one was released. And that chapter allowed me to kind of navigate that grief in a way though that grief took quite a long time the, the grief of my father is a very different kind of grief which is interesting it's interesting how individual and personal each can be in that way but working on this record and getting to perform this record is allowing me to kind of deal with the really horrible things that happen much later on that just my father was just really he just had some really strong opinions and he had some very strong opinions about art making and didn't really see my art making as value, which I, which was interesting. Was, was, was he an artist himself? No, no, no. He was a political scientist. Um, he was a political scientist who <laughs> became a political scientist because of the music of Sun Ra, really. He was heavily influenced by music and sound and was a heavy record collector and, and, I went to many concerts because of him and, and other people in my family. But this kind of style of music, however, whatever style this is, really comes from the things that I was being that I was listening to as a kid. That seems because perfect to me that your father became a political science scientist influenced by Sun Ra and here you are making the music you're making. That 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 lineage seems very stark on some level. Like that seems that's amazing on some level. No, it's it's really clear. And I, you know, his space war and bioethics, that those were kind of his areas of expertise. And when I asked him some years ago, you know, what it, was it about this music that that really moved you? And my mother, too, to a certain extent, though my mother was into some other things as well, singer songwriting stuff and musical theater and all this stuff. But he said that the music supported the politics of the time. Right. And it was exciting that it that it did exactly that. And I thought, huh, yeah. And I feel maybe pro possibly my interest in history has a lot to do with uh, the focus that I was around in my home growing up. Books and records, books and records, books and records. Story, 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 story. And it's very present in this work. You know, it's it's... It's always fascinating to me. My own experience, like coming of age, entering my 20s, I kind of had this oppositional relationship with my parents. And then as I've gotten older, I realize I'm a lot like them. It seems to me you may have made a similar realization. Uh, I mean, even as you say, you can identify that your father in particular was a difficult person. But do you see your parents in you? Like, do you see where? Do, do you, oh, do you, yeah. 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 And I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, when my mother passed away, it was a tough. That was so tough for me because my mother was really the driving force behind keeping me going about some of my ideas. The first person I shared the idea of this project with was my mother. And my mother, though, felt like she couldn't completely understand the music. She was really excited about 
the possibility. And so, and I remember going through a period of, of being scared that I was going to forget what she looked like. I was going to forget what she sounded like. I was going to forget her laugh. I was going to forget. But every time I look in the mirror, I see her. I hear her all the time. My father, you know, I've been placed in situations where I've had to advocate for myself or stand up for myself in particular ways. And he, you know, he is someone, for instance, who sued. He taught at Duke University for many years. And when they did not give him tenure, he sued them for racial discrimination. He was someone who just really did not take things lying down. And I pull on that often. Mm-hmm. And and the black gold signification was a... We were, in a, we were on a car drive when I was maybe like 12 or 13 and I made some comment about, my parents were divorced by this time, and I made some comment about mom, how my mother said, you know, my mother was making a joke. She said, you know, your father wasn't really that attractive, but he, and I just made this joke and he, we were on the highway and he pulled the car over to the side of the highway and he gave me this lecture about black gold and how I was sitting in the presence of black gold. <laughs> And I will never, and I mean, he wasn't mad, but he was like, he was really detailed in this, in this thing. And, and sometimes when I would complain to him about certain things that I was experiencing coming up, he'd say things to me like, well, Matana, you're my daughter. You, you know, you can't think like that. Like what, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? So he had a certain sort of alternative reality that made it possible for him to have a certain sort of self-confidence that I still don't feel like I have in a particular kind of way, because it almost, some of it almost borderlines on like this intense narcissism. Mm -hmm. But I, he grew up poor on the west side of Chicago. Most of the people that he went to school with ended up in prison or dead. And he really is a pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of individual and went on to become an educator who really deeply valued his students, though the way in which he valued his children was highly suspect. <laughs> so I, I, but I, I see myself in terms of my interests, my, my intellectual bent and, and even the manner in which I speak to people and, and the manner he was a constant traveler studying war. Um, He lived in Iran and Iraq during that conflict and India and Nicaragua and and all these places. And, and he was very, he was a very impressive individual to people who would have no idea how fraught things were. His expectations Hmm. for me were so high that often I felt more like more of like a disappointment, especially towards the end, than an actual va- valuable something. And that's something I'm still terrorized by and working through day by day. I sometimes think when we are in creative realms where we're speaking to certain people in our expression, it's, it seems to me you are speaking to your parents a, a lot. Is that fair to say? Uh, I hope, my hope is that the people I'm speaking to are the people that I don't, that I've never met, the people that I looked at in those old photos or whose stories that I'm trying to share. My hopes are that, because I, sometimes I do feel like I hear from them. I hear certain things, you know, especially when present day people, you know, like my father, for instance, when he still was living we're not being incredibly supportive. I feel like I was getting a push from other people in my lineage to keep going. The conversation with my mother, I love my mother to death and I saw her experience things that were really, I mean, uh, my parents, I w- those were two people that I was really happy got divorced. It was not, <laughs> it was not a positive situation. And they were very young. They didn't know each other. My mother was 18. My father was 20. Mm-hmm. And when I think about that, like, wow, I, you know, I, there's no way I'd have been able to keep it together. And they, but my mother experienced a certain oppressiveness through the marriage to my father that still, shakes me at the core when I think about some of the things that I witnessed. So I feel like she cheered me on because she saw that I had a chance not to have to be downtrodden in the way that, that she was. So perhaps it is a 
a conversation with her. She was a really daring individual, and I feel like the daring got shot down many, many, many times. Yeah, they use the word witness, which is an interesting term to use for a child, uh, you know, observing their parents and learning from their parents. You are kind of a witness as you grow older. And I think all I was getting at is that I think sometimes, depending on the relationship you have with your parents, and it sounds like uh, yours was uh, at least a little fraught, if not quite a bit, you know, you're either on some level, I think we grow up and we're either trying to prove our parents, we're trying to make them proud of ourselves. We're either trying to prove them right, prove them wrong, whatever it might be. There's this expectation we have as we develop as adults. And I just feel like some of that sentiment may be in your work here. You are, there's something, I mean, obviously you are who you are and you're trying to figure that out. And the quickest route to that might be your own parents, right? Like just to, how did I get here? Why am I like this? No, but I just, I think fraught is a, like, my relationship with my father was fraught more so in the last decade than it was in the entirety of I see. my okay. life. So I don't feel so fraught is a very, it's a strange term. As you become older, you begin to understand the complications and the complexities of, of relationships and the complexities of family in a way that you don't understand as a child. Yeah. And fraught, I would never use that word with my mother because it wasn't fraught it was highly supportive but people are complicated and i i never thought about am i talking to my parents and my work i I just i feel like i'm talking to i'm standing on the backs of many people who never got a chance to express themselves and i'm just trying to pull them all in in hopes that people can see you know these things that make us so vulnerable um, these things that that place us here, they have value, and and their ideas and stories and 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 thoughts worth sharing. And I think my parents, in the end, regardless of how ridiculous it got with my father towards the end, I really believe that my parents had the be- They wanted the best for me always. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I want to. I want to ask you about this term coin coin where it comes from and what it means to you can you speak to that sure so the coin coin it's a it's a multi-layered thing but the base of that comes from an old family story about a woman by the name of marie matoye who was a very powerful louisiana businesswoman in the you know early 1800s mid 1800s to late 1800s about who i'm related to by marriage though i may also be related by blood it's very possible there was so much intermarriage going on in this community that they were a part of that mm-hmm. there were a lot I've got cousins married on both sides and on that line. And she was one of the first strong female archetypes I was exposed to as a child through my grandmother who's on the cover of chapter four, and her husband, my grandfather, who was raised in that very community. I've been hearing about her forever. And I wanted to umbrella this project that is around the perseverance of the people. I wanted some sort of umbrella term. And I thought a nod to that history was important because it's kind of what started the kindling for me. That and Octavia Butler is a combination between that and and later on reading Octavia Butler's novel Kindred. That kind of, of started things for me. But coin also, when I think of coin, I think of currency, I think of value. So there's that as well. There's been some confusion over the years of whether I'm I'm using the French pronunciation or the English pronunciation as the French pronunciation means quack quack, which of course I'm not. Right. I was horrified when I realized what I had done. But it's it's about a nod to that history because again, Marie Metoye was a woman who how do you say, leased to a a soldier in a business pairing and went on by her previous owner and went on to have many children with this man. And then um, she was manumitted. He manumitted her and gave her a little bit of land. And she managed to turn that into really an empire in, in that part of Louisiana where my lineage was able to live in a way that was quite unusual for people of color during that time period. I see. Okay. I I, I would also, I I would only add to what you said by suggesting that perhaps because you're on 
Constellation Records in Montreal, people might assume you might have been going French. Does that make any sense? Uh, no, because I had been performing the work a good four or five years before those Montreal times. So oh, okay. <laughs> the first thing happened, happened early on. And, and I guess being in Montreal kind of maybe made it a little worse. But I, I think <laughs> people understand that that's not what I'm trying to do. Okay. We have talked a lot about the sort of narrative impulses you've had in, in sort of articulating these stories via your own voice uh, on this record and, and the others. Uh, but I actually, we haven't really talked about the, the music and, and the form, uh, which I would call jazz, and, and why you felt, you know, this was a platform where you could express yourself in this way. And before we get into that, um, I'm curious if we can actually talk about your your earliest days engaging with music as, as a listener, as a fan. Um, you mentioned, you know, your... Your father was really into music. There seemed to be music in your in your house. Your mom was very supportive of your exploration of music. But do you have any recollection as to, you know, how you got interested in music as a young person and then how that translated into actually starting to play yourself? Yeah, I was in public school. And um, at that time, there were still free. I, I don't know what it's like now because most of the schools that I have worked in as an adult were like charter schools or private schools. What city did you grow up in, sorry? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. I was born in Chicago, but my father was an academic, so we moved a lot. I see. And then I continued in Chicago for high school and college. Was moving difficult for you? I'm just curious. I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I'm a bit of a nomad as an adult, so I feel like it really helped to prepare me for an arts life. Hmm. I really liked being in these academic environments as a child. I can say that. Like being a, a university brat was really thrilling for me. So the moves always had something to do with some sort of university environment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I was really, my imagination felt safe in these, which is so ironic because. Uh, the imagination of a brown child in these kind of ivory tower environments. How is that? How's that really possible? But it was possible for me. And so my father went to Cornell University. So I spent some time in upstate New York. My parents met in university. And so I spent some time in a college town outside of Chicago. Um, and my father taught at Duke and also at Tuskegee University. So there was always, always these places. Mm. I think it helped to push my imagination open because as a child being relocated to different places, you have to root yourself somehow. Yeah. You have to find some way of rooting. And I was always able to find that rooting through creativity. Mm -hmm. so, so how did you begin engaging with music, as I said, uh, as, a, as a fan and as a, eventually as a player? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. So at public school, there was a guy that came to the school with all these instruments and set up a instrument zoo in the cafeteria. I think I was probably in third grade. Yeah, it would have been third, third or no, it was third grade. And uh, at each table, he had a different instrument and he would go to each table and play them for us. And we would move to each table with him as he played. Um, and he played the saxophone, and I, I don't really remember much about the saxophone, but when he played the clarinet, I remember so clearly I ran home that day and said, I have to play that instrument. <laughs> There's something about the sound of, of that instrument. I need to play that instrument. And at the time, you know, we're on, my parents were on a graduate school budget. There was no money for that sort of thing, but you could get free instruments through that program. And so... I was able to get a free clarinet and I, and I, this guy would come to class and that was a tough time because at that time, actually, now that I think of it, I was first diagnosed with some kind of learning disorder and I was being put in these remedial reading classes, which was, my parents were always on the side of that being more racist than being actually true because right. I was a voracious reader. Um, but they had put me in this predominantly white school that was close to the university and my parents often felt like the teachers had it out for me. So I, I was in this remedial reading class and my, the boon of that class 
one day a week is that this guy would come and take us out of that class, the musicians, and give us a lesson together. And, and that began my interest in instrumental music. And for some reason, there's something about that instrument that I, I was able to really pick up that that teacher contacted my parents and said, you know, she's really good at this. And I would, you know, sell you a clarinet for her because she should be playing. But at the time, my parents couldn't afford it. So we ended up not doing that. And I went on to do like, I got involved in like local choruses and my parents were involved in some kind of like radical black arts movement group. So I was like in an all black children's course for a little while. And, and then I started doing a little bit of musical theater and things just kept going on and on and on um, until I got to high school and I wanted to go to this performing arts high school and I couldn't get in. Uh, they had no more vocal. You couldn't get in the vocal and I wasn't really a great dancer. They had like a dance program, but they had a band program. And uh, my uncle, God bless him, he found a clarinet for $50 at a pawn shop and said, you know, take this and go audition on this. And I got in on that. And then I continued the instrumental studies from there. Okay. Now, have you heard things or at any point in your life that may have inspired your approach to the coin coin? series uh, have you uh, were there artists or albums where you're like yes this is an entry point into something i want to express or do you feel like this was something you more or less wholly invented well no i wouldn't i i definitely would never say that i wholly invented whatever has happened here i i mean i also my grandmother who's on the cover of chapter four by this time um she was, I was in her life a lot more regularly. We lived with her for a while and she took us to the opera. She, she had season tickets to the Chicago Lyric. And we also saw a lot of theater. And I think it, it was a combination of seeing narrative, uh, seeing the, the cross genres that are present in, in a really great opera, mm. the books and records and, experimental music that really blew things open. And then in Chicago, being around musicians of my generation who were also really into, quote unquote, original music, original approach. And then, you know, I did go to a conservatory program in Chicago where I was told often that my ideas were not valid. And I think that's also one of the things that pushed me over the edge to find, to understand, and maybe that bounces back to my father, this idea of questioning. Right. Never let anybody tell you that your ability is such and such. You know, always question these things. Um, allowed me to question a bit more and then getting deeper and deeper into improvised music. It just all kind of uh, came together, I think. No, it it seems to have for sure. I mean, you mentioned musicals there for a moment, but there is a theatrical bent, I would say, to the music on this chapter in particular. Do you see it as being more than a record per se? Could you see it being a, a, a sort some sort of stage production beyond you know yeah. beyond beyond performing the way you have been? Yeah. So I you know there was a period in that whole kind of music exploration as a kid where I decided I wanted to be a playwright. And so, and that's still something that's poking at me and I need to deal with that. And I'm not sure I, like this recorded format is not enough for that I, those ideas that I have. Mm. And I also, in Chicago, I got involved in actual theater, playing in pit bands at, or doing original music for uh, stage plays at like the Steppenwolf Theater and, and places like that where I got really excited about the possible, about the possibility of theater. And I still think about it. And, and I think these records are kind of my compromise for the moment. I, I feel there's something else bubbling in me that has not gotten out yet, that doesn't have anything to even do with this series, uh, that it's something else that's kind of on a much wider scope theatrical scope even. yeah yeah that's that's kind of what I'm getting at when I when I hear this record are, are there in the time we have left and it's not we don't have a lot I, I don't think I, I just am curious if you could speak about this record in terms of its intent in an overarching sense in a general sense um, as you've 
been able to process this record now that it's not only done, it's out there in the world circulating. And I know in my own experience, sometimes when, when a thing is finally out, uh, you let go of it a little bit, but you also learn things about it. Has that been the case for you? Are there things about this record that you're processing f- uh, in, a, in a more from a, from a fresher perspective, so to speak, uh, having been so close to it for so long? Uh, has something kind of revealed itself to you? Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. Like it's for one, it's, um, you know, I've been doing lots of different things in the name of sound since the release of the last record. And, and I don't do a very good job at telling people about some of those things. And so it's, you know, commissions for bigger ensembles, orchestras, choruses, all these different uh, uh, sound installation work and exhibitions and things that I'm trying to be involved in. And this work, is my steady piece it gives me it's like an anchor like when when these records come back around like when i performed this record the other night i felt like right this is my this is my boat (laughs) this is my like boat that's going to carry me from now until whatever my end days are and i'm seeing i'm seeing not just this record, but I'm looking at the four records so far side by side and realizing that, oh, wow. And as I think about the records that are coming after, it's like, ah, I'm creating a community here. This is like, uh, this is actual a community of characters. And there's so many different ways I'm going to be able to approach this work as, as a, as a full work with all the finished chapters or even just one by one. And it, it fills me with so much joy and, and, and also fear of like, Oh, well, there are many different ways to approach this. Is there a wrong way? It's just sparking new ideas. It's also solidified for me, the importance of performance for me as ritual, as a healing space, as, as just um, fellowship really. And how, as I dig deeper into my studio practice of trying to make the work, how vital also sharing the work really, really is to me. I think I lost that for a moment as I got deeper and deeper into the visual art world Hmm. and trying to figure out, well, what's something doesn't feel right. And what doesn't feel right is that balance. The balance of performance to visual work is not where I want it to be. And so this next phase of life is going to be about balancing that out a bit more because I need to do this work. It's not just about the work needing to be around. Well, I mean, that sounds very exciting and, and focused. You you mentioned uh, that there, you're thinking about these uh, the next records. Uh, I usually ask uh, towards the end of a chat like this, you know, what's next? And so I, I'm curious about that. What's next for you both within uh, the coin coin series and, and anything else. Uh, but also you sound very organized on some level. Uh, okay. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, cu- I'm curious how mapped out this series is in terms of the chapters. I mean, is it a, is it a thing where you're, you're making, you, you know, the next chapter emerges on its own and you haven't foreseen where the series will go, or do you have an idea of where the series will go? So, sorry, what's next? Also this series, I'm just curious about, how organized you really are. <laughs> no, I mean, this series has been mapped out from its inception. And, and I will say there was one chapter that probably will never see the light of day because it just didn't, in the end, it just actually didn't really work out in the way that I wanted to. Maybe after all 12 are released, I'll be like, oh, here's this extra. Um, but they've been mapped out from the inception in 2000. 2006 and I've been trying to follow that map as close well as close to possible as I could I've kind of released them out of order that's the only thing like chapter three uh, that came out last actually should have been chapter one and chapter one should have been chapter two and so on um, sorry are, are these chapters conceptually complete or are they actually recorded and you're releasing them in whatever sequence well, they're there some of them are conceptually complete but some of them have been performed ah. some people don't realize that they that earlier on in this work i was performing other chapters that have not yet been recorded hmm. for on uh because i the only way i could work on the work was through performance because at that time I just didn't have 
money just to keep people in rehearsals, but I could find money to keep people in performance. So, so yeah, so they've been mapped out, but the, the problem and conceptually and, and half written pretty much all of them. The, the struggle is though, I often find that the, the chapters that I want to release, sometimes I want to release them in conjunction with some really important issues that are moving through the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. So now I'm actually struggling with chapters five, six, and seven in terms of which order I want to, do I want to stick to where chapter, what chapter five was supposed to be in chapter six, or do I want to just flip it? Or do I just want to release, maybe I'll release chapter seven next. Right. And the people, so I'm trying to think about the possibility of that and trying to, figure it out okay and be and beyond the coin coin series it sounds like you're you're keeping busy well you're obviously in berlin as we established but is there yeah. any, any other work I'm, I'm in berlin i'm uh working on my first uh orchestra commission that will premiere in 2021 also in germany i am playing on other people's stuff i'm working on a new exhibition of scores that'll happen in new york in the spring and also in Europe in the spring, I'm constantly writing, I'm teaching workshops, I'm doing just about everything <laughs> I need to do to stay afloat, but I need to do better at, at documenting things online. I'm just, I've gotten really bad at that. I've gotten completely overwhelmed with Twitter and Instagram and website and website and website and and mailing list mailing list. so just trying to figure out the next step with that is what i'm trying it's to a do. lot of stuff that we have to manage in order to keep well i'm not even sure why we do it i guess to keep people informed right and also to create our own little digital archives of what we've been up to yeah i think it's you know i always thought that the diy aesthetic of the internet and the possible the possibility of revolution through these mediums which is an ironic thing to say also is is high and so and it's allowed me to craft my own narrative and push back against people like oh you know this jazz jazz i don't even know if this is jazz i don't <laughs> if, at, at this point if that's what people want i give it to them i don't mind being connected to that powerful lineage i love that music but i'm not particularly completely sure what this is that i'm charting and what i would call it and having an online presence allows me to at least place my point of view. Well, I think the fact that you can't categorize it and we can't categorize it means it's something special. Uh, that's my take oh, on it. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So this remarkable new album is Coin Coin Chapter 4, Memphis. It's available via Constellation Records, and people can learn more about it at cstrecords.com. But you had mentioned some social media and stuff there. Where, where would you like people to go to follow you? Uh, for the moment, they should just go to matanaroberts.com. I think I'm about to post a digital archive on Tumblr. I think that's about to happen. Oh. Uh, You're adding I, another thing to your... <laughs> I know. I don't have time. I don't have time. I But I'm just trying to figure... I was on Twitter for many years and... and my Twitter got deleted and I just am too lazy to go back into whatever that was. And Instagram, I can't, Instagram is owned by Facebook. I can't, I hate Facebook. So yeah. just trying to figure out how to deal with these multinational hosted, you know, mm -hmm. do it yourself sites I'm still struggling with. But on matanaroberts.com, there's a page on there called Log and it's just kind of like a newsletter. And generally I will, list other spaces to find me okay all right well that's that's good to know uh, Matana, there's a song from uh this chapter that we can go out on chapter four memphis uh would you select one for us and maybe explain why you've chosen it uh i select her mighty waters run which is just uh my rearrangement and added lyrics to um an old negro spiritual called roll yield chariot that became a uh, a uh, sea shanty, more more so known as a drop of Nelson's blood. All of the coin coin segments have these vocal, these groups singing pieces on them for the purpose of singing them with people in performance, and and I just love the fellowship and collectivity of them. Okay, well, that's well said. All right, this is her mighty waters run from Coin Coin Chapter Four. 
Memphis. Uh, Matana, thank you so much for being on my show and having this conversation. And I, I hope you enjoyed it. And I wish you the best of luck going forward. Thank you. Take care. Roll, roll, will roll, roll, will roll, roll, will roll, roll, will life goes on as the time. Yeah.
All my gratitude to Matana Roberts for appearing on this, the 524th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on things like Spotify and Audio Boom and YouTube as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for in any of those things or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi-regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control on Facebook and follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly at Vish Kana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Again, there's now a $6 or more tier and that gets you exclusive content. So if you, if you donate $6 or more a month, you have access to things uh, from my audio archives and you can learn more about all of this at patreon.com slash creative control. Thanks again, as always, to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support for the show. And for his loans, his musical loans, he lends me some music sometimes, my pal Jim Guthrie. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you very much for listening to this episode with uh, me and Matana, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you consider uh, going into the back catalog of episodes if you're new to the show and discovering all of the other episodes there are and telling your friends to maybe do the same and maybe even subscribing to the podcast. You might uh, you might like it. You might like doing that. I don't know. Anyway, I must leave you, but I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>